Um, good morning. So, um, first of all, of course, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Tom and Julia, for inviting me to be here. Um, let me start off by saying that um, I feel a little bit out of place, at least I feel a little bit out of place in the sense that I am far from a specialist of the sonic arts. My background is in theater and performance uh, studies. However, um, I am not um, deterred by this. As, um, as uh, Julia also mentioned, participation often seems to be about finding a kind of intermediary position between the layman and uh, the specialist. So in that sense, I think, um, I am uh, in a good position here to speak. There's also another reason why I'm here. Um, my presentation refers to a, a small-scale research in progress that is actually part of this Interfaces European project um, that focuses on how new performance uh, formats that break with the traditional musical concert setup and that, of course, emerged as an auxiliary to the disciplinary formatting of attention in the 19th century bourgeois theater. Um, uh, how new performance uh, formats um, can um, uh, uh, invite us to think differently about um, experiencing uh, music. <clears throat> Not just any uh, performance configuration, but um, the project specifically focuses on um, the intersection between uh, performance and the exhibition, uh, a format that is primarily linked, of course, with the context of the visual arts, galleries and uh, museums. And in particular, it looks at uh, the 2015 project Work, Travail, Arbeit. So the question is, uh, what happens when a, a live art, a piece of live art, enters into the supposedly neutral uh, space of uh, the white cube, what happens when um, the frontal temporally confined format of the theater or of the concert hall with its immobile audience and its own defined space uh, clearly demarcated and separated from uh, the performers, both musicians and dancers. Uh, well, what happens when we withdraw out of the space and enter into the, the gallery? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on a text and I'm going to read parts of the text, some things I will um, paraphrase. But maybe to start it would be good to say a little bit more about uh, Work, Travail, Arbeit, and I have some um, images. So um, the project um, was initiated by uh, the Belgian choreographer uh, Andresa de Keersmaker of Rosas, and it is actually a reimagination of a existing piece called Vortex Temporum, which was a choreography set on the music uh, of uh, Gérard Griset, with the same title. And it was reimagined as a durational work entitled Work, Travail, Arbeit. Conceived in collaboration with um, ICTUS and the Center for Contemporary um, Arts uh, Reels in Brussels. Um, thank you. Um, the, so the, 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 the original composition or the original choreography is being transposed into this um, exhibition um, space. And what is, uh, I think, important is to um, realize that what the project does is not really mimic um, the theater setting. So it's not transforming the uh, exhibition space into a kind of pseudo um, theater. Instead, um, the exhibition, uh, both in its spatial and in its temporal uh, features, is being incorporated to create a nine-week-long choreographic exhibition. The term choreo choreographic exhibition is the word used by uh, the Kirschmaker. So the key elements of the original um, production um, remain the same. The choreographic material is the same. Um, of course, the music also of Griset, the use of uh, floor patterns, the principle of linking individual dancers' movement uh, to um, individual musicians and uh, their musical lines within uh, the piece of uh, Griset. But in this transposition, the very dense and complex one-hour performance is being smeared out, stretched, decomposed. Uh, the dramaturge of the project says it's being exploded um, in the sense that 
the seven lines that are in the piece that are each time a combination of an instrument and a, uh, a dancer um, are being um, separated um, in 12 parts, each one hour long. So it's a little bit complex. but um, So you get um, uh, uh, one hour, a cycle of 12 hours um, where in each hour um, for example, a dancer and an instrument, several dancers and a few instruments uh, are present their, um, their um, um, composition and choreography. Um, it's quite a complex work, and it, um, actually um, I'm not going to focus on the structure itself or on the movements of transposing this to the exhibition hall, but more on questions that have to do with um, spectatorship. I'm sure some of you will have seen the work, um, and some of, the, some of you, as I can see, actually participated in, uh, in the work. So. so it's not my intention here to lay out the genealogy uh, of uh, this work, but um, look at this work and its uh, consecutive versions in different museums of contemporary art, particularly uh, as it was reimagined for the Turbine Hall in uh, Tate Modern and the Marin uh, Atrium of MoMA in, uh, in New York and pose the question how, um, when sound fills the rooms and the hallways of the museum, um, spectatorship is being transformed or mutated. So how does the work of performance, when it enters into the museum, transforms the museum space, transforms uh, spectatorships? What kind of spectatorships um, emerge um, at that point? And what can this learn us regarding um, participation? Um, what I think is important is that um, the interaction between the visual arts and the performing arts um, is interesting in the context of this project because the historically established codes, rituals, and modes of spectatorship of these distinctive uh, disciplines, so disciplines of the, 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 so the museum and um, the, the, the life arts, the performing arts, need to be renegotiated again and again with each instantiation of uh, this uh, project. And I hope to give a few examples of that. Um, so these are images from the first part um, in real, so the nine-week uh, version. These are some images from uh, the version in the Tate Gallery um, in the Turbine Hall. And here you can see some images uh, that are from the Marin uh, Atrium in, uh, in New York. So, um, so the background of this presentation is the recent intrusion of dance into the museum, which fits the current desire of the contemporary visual art world to document, collect, and exhibit immaterial works of art like performance art, theater, and dance. There are examples of that throughout the 20th century. MoMA, for example, has had a department um, destined to curating um, exhibitions in relationship to the performing arts. But it's only in the last decades um, that it has become a global phenomenon. If you look at the two um, institutions, MoMA and Tate, that are at issue here, um, a few dates are clear or clearly demonstrate this um, shift. In 2008, the Department of Media um, became the Department of Media and Performance in MoMA. Um, they have a regular performance um, uh, programming, uh, especially in the Annex um, PS1, where they organize the Volkswagen Sunday uh, sessions. Tate Modern um, has a similar interest, and it seems to be more systematic compared to MoMA, where it's more intermittent. In 2012, which is an important date, they started the BMW Tate Live series and opened the tanks, a uh, space designated to showing installation art and performance uh, art. It's interesting that it, our car makes that sponsor a performance. Um, BMW uses the art of performance actually as a way to uh, sell its cars. Anyway, um, so um, apart from this, um, Tate Gallery has also been collecting life arts. Among them, um, objects of Abramovich's um, performance, uh, of some of Abramovich's uh, performance um, work, uh, but also the scores of immaterial works of Tino Segal and uh, Tanya Bruguera. 
and it is um, and it has uh, invested greatly in research projects about this contentious issue of what does it mean if, as a museum, you try to collect um, ephemeral transitory uh, work. They have a more art historical take on it, and I think that is interesting. Uh, curator Catherine Wood, who is the performance curator at Tate, um, has explained that they are interested in tracing the relationship between the minor histories of art and the major histories of art. And the minor histories of art are then related to photography and video, for example, but also recently um, performance and um, the performing arts and performance art in relationship to the major um, histories of painting and uh, sculpture. But of course, this is not an Anglo-American um, phenomenon. Um, in uh, Belgium, for example, we have festivals dedicated to this interaction between the visual arts and the performing arts with Performatique in Kajetheater or Playground in Stuck. In Stuck. And we can also see that um, galleries focus on, it, on this, like Jan Mott Gallery. Um, or um, as part of Kunstfestival des Arts, we see this exploration of the intersections between the performing arts and the visual arts. Um, it would be difficult to capture the full breadth and width of this uh, movement. But I am going to give three genealogies, three lines, that kind of show um, the scope of this intrusion of live arts into the museum. Uh, the first one is uh, focused on performance um, art. Performance art, of course, is primarily um, situated in the history of the visual arts, and historically, it has often taken on an antagonistic relationship um, to the theater and to the museum. As an anti-institutional movement, both in the historical avant-garde and in the post-war um, avant-garde, it deliberately moved outside of the museum and agitated against the art market. Peggy Phelan, when, when defining performance, said that performance becomes itself through disappearance and this uh, ontological ephemeral, ephemerality uh, made it so that performance um, conceived of itself by its very nature as a transgressive um, art form, resisting the stabilizing force of the museum. Interestingly, um, around the year 2000, we see a newfound interest in um, bringing uh, performance art back into uh, the museum. And an uh, important conduit for this was um, artistic reenactment. Um, the paradig paradigmatic example probably is um, uh, Marina Abramovic's Seven um, Easy Pieces in Guggenheim, where she um, reenacts or reperforms, as she calls it, um, important. Um, works from the performance art movement in the 60s and the 70s, including her own work. And then, of course, the retrospective of her work, uh, The Artist is Present, in, um, in MoMA. Several scholars have pointed out that reenactment um, is less relevant today, but there is an interest in um, uh, cataloging and um, collecting scores of uh, performances. A second uh, genealogy has to do with a re-exploration of the contaminations between dance and the visual arts that existed in the post-war history of dance. Uh, this is especially linked to collaborations between choreographers and artists in the context of the Judge and Church um, movement, for example. And thirdly, and, and, um, is uh, the interest of the museums to um, bring... Um, work that is uh, linked with dance tradition rather than with the visual arts uh, traditions into the, into the museum, including um, European dance traditions and European conceptual dance. So um, choreographers like Jérôme Belk, Xavier Leroy, Boris Charmatz, Maria Hassabi, also, of course, Andrés de Keersmaker and William Forsythe have um, been entered into the museum, have shown their work, and in some cases have really used and explored the format of the exhibition and used it to their advantage to question the status of uh, dance, the status of their own work, and um, question and inter interpolate the uh, museum space um, itself. And this work is an example of that. Um, 
I think at this point, it might be a good idea to explain the title of my presentation, The Museum Echoes. Uh, in Greek mythology, as some of you might know, um, Echo is a mountain nymph that is, uh, who is punished by Zeus' wife, the eternally jealous Hera, to be only able to speak the last few words spoken to her. So Echo loses her own voice as she can only um, repeat the words of the other, the other that speaks to her. The metaphor of the echo here can be read negatively as reflecting on the continued and unresolved ambivalence that characterizes the entry of life art into the museum. The question is then to what extent does the museum as a forceful machinery for canonization and the construction of art history um, takes the voice of life art uh, away. And I want to point out some critical, um, critical um, assessments of this particular uh, movement. The first one is art historical. The works of life art are being situated into a historical narrative of the visual arts. Uh, dance, of course, seems um, particularly hard to archive or uh, record. While we can store its scores, collect photographs or video documentation, uh, or try to capture the performative energy of the work through performative writing or to criticism, those traces are not the work itself. While those records can be evocative by making us move again physically to re-performance, or reenactment, or mentally in our imagination, or through critical writing. While those records can, as Rebecca Schneider claimed, trouble the strict distinction between uh, the performance as disappearance and the record as remainder, within the context of the museum, dance seems particularly reliant on its continual repetition to persist. So the question is then, is that um, sustainable? Um, to put it very negatively, is this a fad? So how can we bring dance um, in the museum as part of uh, a certain history of the visual arts? And here you can already uh, find a kind of in uh, invitation to start and think about the different kind of institution that is somehow in the gray zone uh, between the museum and um, the theater. Um, and there are actually uh, proposals to explore this, and the Tanks and Tethys is doing something similar. Although there are problems, of course, to what extent can we merge together um, production methods, creation methods of theater, and um, um, the way that work is, for example, acquired within uh, the museum. This actually points towards a second critique that is often being... Um, uh, being um, uh, uh, yeah, brought forth in relationship to this um, connection between life art and the museum, namely that it becomes an example of um, a, an economy that is primarily focused on immaterial or um, affective labor. And indeed, um, there have been uh, instances where there has been uh, problems with labor relationships of performance that were paid very little, for example. What does it mean if you hire a performance to do a work of art? Um, and pay him for just an hour, even though, of course, this performer, be it a musician or a, um, a dancer, has had a long investment into his craft um, through training, uh, through repetition, um, through long creation processes to come to this particular work. Showing performance is different than acquiring a painting or a sculpture, uh, for example. And there are, of course, problems as well, because when you bring a body into the museums, um, well, sculptures can break, but bodies can die. So how are you going to create a kind of environment that is um, um, uh, safe and, um, and protective for uh, this particular art form? And then a third recurrent critique is often about the evenmentalization of the contemporary arts, that performance art somehow plays into um, the... Um, transformation of the Museum of Contemporary Art into a place for leisure and um, entertainment. Um, if you want to 
explore this further, uh, Sven Lütiken is one of the uh, persons who has written extensively uh, in, uh, on that, uh, particularly in a text called Dance Factory, and the title kind of um, uh, gives a hint uh, about his position towards that. Um, for my part, however, I think that these critical points, though relevant, um, are, um, uh, are also kind of giving a too limited uh, view on this phenomenon. In fact, especially in the case of these choreographic exhibitions that appropriate the exhibition time, so that create performance work that is set within the, um, within the temporal uh, mark, uh, markings and parameters of the exhibition. So this exhibition, for example, starts when the museum opens and ends when the, museum's clo uh, when the museum closes. Um, um, uh, these projects then also use the multi-perspectivism, the fact that you can actually walk around, that you have a mobile uh, spectator, are interesting to look into further, uh, especially as... Um, as a way to explore what spectatorship means in this particular context. Not just spectatorship um, in the museum, but also spectatorship in a broader social, um, cultural and socio-economical um, sense. Um, I'm looking at my time, okay. Um, so in my, in my research, and, and, and I have a long bit on this, but I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to, I'm just going to paraphrase it here. Um, I'm looking at, um, more historical approaches to the museum, um, especially um, by uh, the Australian historian Tony Bennett, that has um, um, focused on what he calls the exhibitionary complex uh, of the museum. Particularly, he's interested in the way he's interested in the way in which, in the 19th century, the museum um, emerged as a kind of um, machinery that would um, bring the spectator or the visitor to the museum in a state of self-regulation. He is, of course, uh, inspired by uh, Michel Foucault. Um, what is so fascinating in this work of Bennett is that um, he not only looks um, at what the museum um, represents, but also to the way in which visitors embody certain values embody in the sense of corporal um, when they enter into the museum. They embody it in a performative way through their own performance. For example, uh, certain approaches of history that um, uh, enter uh, cultural imagination in the 19th century like uh, evolutionary thought or chronological historiography, the idea that history is, uh, can be represented as a strict chronology, uh, linear chronology, a timeline are actually enacted by the visitors. So the idea is that in the museum you can see, for example, history as a chronological timeline, but at the same time, you realize it performatively by walking through the exhibition. So um, the point that, um, uh, why is this so interesting? Well, it's interesting because it's, it, it very much invites us to look at spectatorship not just as a way of viewing, but also as embodying and performatively reproducing certain um, uh, cultural uh, codes and uh, conventions. And there are certain researchers that have continued working on that. Um, Dorothea von Hantelmann is a German art historian that has written a book called How to Do Things with Art. And as the title shows, it also uh, focuses on this performative uh, aspect of um, uh, art and art museums. It looks at the reality-producing effect of uh, the um, museum, for example, and she in particular is interested in how the museum actually um, helps us um, or forms uh, an individual way of relating to objects. It, it, it really reminds, of, reminds us of uh, a text by Walter Benjamin who, who wrote about the universal exhibitions in the 19th century where he said that what uh, the visitor to the universal exhibition is doing is uh, training to become a consumer. He cannot buy the objects that he sees, but he starts to have a relationship with these objects that he can then 
uh, actualize the moment that he actually enters into the market. So it's a kind of training of our relationship towards objects. And what von Hantelmann writes is that the history of the 20th century, um, the exhibition format actually plays with these relationships. Um, and the emergence of more intersubjective, intersubjective participatory works of art starting from the 90s with relational aesthetics, for example, where community building and, uh, and uh, the, the social dynamics of art becomes important, is for her actually an indication of changing economical relationships, a changing relationship that we have towards, an ob towards the object. If the art gallery was about the way that we relate to uh, art objects, individually relate to art objects, that was a reflection of market economy forces where um, we have to acquire commodities. In uh, other situations where this intersubjectivity becomes important, the shift is being made towards economic, an, an economy where you do not do, no longer acquire um, uh, objects, uh, but an economy that is more focused on uh, immaterial goods like services or effective labor. Um, where you, that is about desire, uh, about the way you represent and perform uh, yourself. Uh, and this becomes reflected also in the emergence of uh, performance in the, in the museum. So, um, yeah, I, I quickly went through what, um, two, two pages uh, of, of text. Um, so what, what, I'm, what I'm interested here is that the museum spectatorship as a performative process that both reproduces existing codes and conventions through embodied uh, repetition um, Um, so this, this is what we find is this theoretical framework. But I would also contend that um, in, in, the, um, in these choreographic exhibitions, the focus is less on the kind of spatial regulation of the behavior of the visitors, but more focused on temporal um, aspects, so on the temporality. And the second point I think uh, that is important in relationship to this theoretical framework is that um, spectatorship in these examples is often very messy. The suggestion of the white cube is that it is a kind of neutral space. However, um, it is far from a clean space the moment that um, choreographic practices enter into the uh, museum. There's a lot of tension here, and I think here it's important to think about participation uh, in relationship to what um, what um, Claire Bishop uh, wrote, where she focuses very much on um, uh, the fact that participatory artwork or interesting participatory artwork um, is um, more about the tension and the discomfort uh, of participating. That participation not um, simply and automatically leads toward a more de-hierarchized, democratic, uh, social um, interaction but there are things at stake that have to do with power relationships as well. And you see this reflected in uh, some of these um, uh, performative exhibitions where you are in a situation where you constantly need to renegotiate and negotiate your own position as a spectator uh, with regards to other spectators and with regards to the work that you uh, see. So again, uh, a page uh, in a few uh, sentences. So um, to end, um, because I only have a few more minutes, um, I, would look at, uh, I would like to look at a, a few other echoes of the museum. Um, echoes of the museum that um, are not so negatively formulated as my first um, echo. Um, I have three echoes. Uh, the first echo has to do with spatial reverberation. The second echo has to do with temporality and duration, and the third echo has to do with a temporalization of uh, visual art. I will quickly say something about the first echo. The first echo has to do with um, the fact that in a work like Work Travai Arbeit, while it's not a participatory artwork, um, there is a certain codependency uh, between dancers, uh, musicians, and uh, visitors. There are um, um, examples where um, 
spectators would intervene, uh, both in, in this work, but also in other um, similar uh, dance exhibitions or choreographic exhibitions. But this is not something that is encouraged or welcomed. Still, in this piece, there's a very interesting way of constantly working with, often even against, the spectator. There is a play of gazes. Dancers and musicians recognize the presence of the audience, often trading gazes with the spectators and adapting their positions and trajectories in relationship to the physical space occupied by the spectator's body. So uh, the choreographer, Andrzej de Kirchmark, describes this relationship of the performers to the audience with a physical metaphor drawn from nature. So the performers are supposed to be like water uh, that needs to find its ways around stones. Likewise, spectators are often compelled to change uh, position not just to make sure that they are not run over by a grand piano, for example, but also because the choreography uses certain strategies to prompt spectators to become mobile um, or to draw them into the performance uh, space. One of these strategies, for example, was in wheels that the work was distributed over two spaces and sometimes you had to move to be able to see the work. In Tate Gallery, it had something to do with the large uh, surface uh, where certain parts were very, very far away, so you had to move um, to get, uh, to get uh, there. Um, that this is not a clean process, or that these white cubes are not kind of neutral, clean places, is very clear in uh, Tate Gallery, um, where um, you actually constantly need to think where I'm going to position myself as a spectator. You could decide to be really immersed immersed within the composition or within the choreography, or look for the space, this rim, uh, where you are somehow in between the performance space and the audience. You can go back to the more frontal uh, sides, a classical theater setting, or actually move to um, a, a, um, a balcony and look down, gaining a sort of panoramic view of the performance or even go to another gallery where the performance becomes something very far away. So spectatorship here is very much, um, um, or it seems to be that the spectator itself can kind of change objectives, uh, change lenses um, uh, in the way uh, she looks at uh, the, uh, the performance. So there's a constant framing and reframing a constant positioning and repositioning of where you are um, in relationship to the performance. Um, this positioning also goes beyond the space itself because um, these life art performances are very often uh, uh, distributed and redistributed through social media. So they are in the actual um, here and now of the performance space but also in the virtual space, enacted in the virtual uh, space. Um, the third, my second echo had to do with um, temporality and uh, duration. Um, I'm going to skip again a part and, and focus on the final point um, uh, of this uh, question about uh, duration and then say something about uh, the temporalization of visual arts. So I'm going to go over three, three four minutes. Um, so... What is particular about Bergtravai Arbeit is that the music plays a central role. Uh, and I think that the, 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 the myth of the echo allows us here to, um, to kind of develop um, a reading. Perhaps um, it is not the museum that takes away the voice of life art, but life art that fills the museum with its reverberating sound, taking position of both the space and the visitors. Um, compared to other projects where dance is brought into the museum, the central role of contemporary music is key. The musicians are given equal attention as the dancers. According to the dramaturg Bojana Svejic, it offers an occasion to actually zoom into the kinesthetic qualities of gesture, of extending techniques that Griset invented for uh, the classical instruments. As part of an, uh, a choreographic exhibition, spectators are invited to consider not just the intricate ways the music is transposed to the dancing bodies, but also how it emerges from the physicality of the musicians. You are invited to look, or maybe better to listen and sense almost analytically, 
to speculate about the choreographic principles that tie the movement material to the music, and because of the long duration and cyclical structure of the work, the immediacy of your sensory experience becomes gradually more and more layered by the memory of uh, previous movements, and therefore also um, by the expectations and speculations of the movements that are still to come. Even if the spectator is not a musicologist or knowledgeable about uh, Grisey's music, which I am not, um, there is a sense that an embodied experience from the inside of the composition becomes possible. To the durational experience of the work, it allows spectators to explore as if from the inside emerged in both the musical and choreographic composition, the work through its exposition in uh, space and uh, time. And the last point, well, the museum is literally an echo in the Marin Auditorium, for example, in MOBA. Um, um, the sound of the music played in the, in the central, uh, so the Marin Auditorium is kind of a, a shaft where all the exhibition spaces are structured around. So the echo of the museum can literally and figuratively fundamentally transform the experience of both performance and of the visual arts. The Marin Auditorium functioned as a sound box emitting Grisey's music throughout the different levels of the exhibition halls. It served as a constant reminder of the bodies performing down below and therefore, metonymically, of the role of the body in both the creation and reception of the artwork. In MoMA, the museum's echoes sometimes created striking constellations. For example, between the room dedicated to abstract expressionist work of Bernard Newman and Jackson Pollock. So this is a, a room where you have the, the Newman painting and the Pollock painting, and through that window you actually look down on the, on the atrium. These works, which according to Michael Fried in his famous text, Art and Object Hook, are endowed with presentness, as if they exist outside of time, eternal, untouched and untouchable by the spectator, suddenly are confronted with artworks that, are, that only become themselves through time. Sound here functions as a connective tissue between these disciplines, provoking us to do a double take, not just to um, reconsider the role of performance in our experience of these works, but also of the museum as an archival institution working against the disappearance, ephemerality, ephemerality loss, values that art history attributes to um, performance. So it's these echoes, the, 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 the reverberations that have to do with space, with temporality, and then here with this kind of um, echoing of, um, uh, of the temporality of uh, visual arts that uh, I think is, um, are, are uh, being enabled by uh, the moment where live art enter, in, enters into the gallery. Okay, um, thank you very much.